Hi, Angie, I'm going to make you the presenter now. Don't worry, you don't have to use your video cam, but you could still share your screen so we could talk about what's happening in the ags here. Uh, really appreciate you returning to face. Hi, Hi, Angie. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you so much for returning. Yes, thanks for having me. Um, yes. I'm showing, I think I'm showing the, the right screen. My quote board is what's pulled up right now, I believe. On That's this side. right. All that's right, right. I just want to make sure. <laughs> Otherwise, okay. you're going to look at Tweak Deck, and, and that's uh, going to be. Uh, I, I look at that too many hours a day, Angie. So, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I go to I, I go to Twitter anonymous meetings. So, yeah. uh, uh, Angie, you know, last time we were together, uh, one of the things that stood out to me was uh, you talking about the Chinese, and this was way, way pre-tariff talk, stockpiling mm -hmm. wheat in a big way. Are they still doing it, and are they doing it away from the U.S., like Australian wheat, or uh, are they still in that Joseph you know, from the Bible, uh, stockpiling wheat strategy. Yeah, yeah, it's actually uh, funny in an in ironic sense that you would ask, uh, simply because we did see a, an updated USDA number released last week um, that actually incorporated the Chinese National Statistics Board's um, summary of production. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and key up the USDA numbers from last week so you guys can take a look at uh, what we saw from a change standpoint there. Um, we actually okay. saw them um, increase uh, production estimates and increase um, stocks estimates uh, for both wheat and corn. Corn was actually the big story. Um, we saw corn um, levels actually double. Um, and Double so, exports to China? No, double uh, Chinese supplies. So they oh, okay. basically went and, and uh, surprise found uh, an additional Other markets. seven billion bushels. Yeah, seven billion bushels of corn production. So what I'll do is is uh, I've got the wheat value or the wheat numbers pulled up here. One second. It's okay, nice so that you know, that's that's interesting. So uh, yeah, they didn't they so they didn't let. This. Okay, go ahead, Angie. Yeah, so here's this right here. If, if you look at, uh, this is the world wheat supply and use uh, outlined by the USDA released last week. And if you take a look at Chinese numbers right here, in October, uh, their production number was around 127 uh, million metric tons. So a metric ton of wheat's about 37 bushel. Um, so just under 4.7 billion um, bushels of production. Uh, we saw that increase, that, that beginning sex number increase from the USDA up pretty significantly. So that is a, a result of an increase in production as well as a holdover of supplies here over the last 10 years. So we hadn't had an update from the Chinese National Statistics Board in, in about a decade. Um, so they came out and said, hey, our beginning stocks, what we started with before production took place this year um, is up about 163 million bushels versus a year ago. And then we also saw an increase of overall production estimates by about four and a half million metric tons. So about 165 million bushel increase on that side, which increased their overall holdings, if you look at the end here, yeah. um, versus what we were expecting um, pretty significantly, um, up uh, seven and a half million metric ton, or doing the math as we talk about 273 million bushel. Now, the one thing that is of most importance when it comes to, to Chinese wheat is the, the idea or the fact that a lot of it is of you know, non-human uh, consum consumption uh, quality. Um, it's it's really one of those things. There's been conversations about seeing um, issues with, um, you know, heavy metal toxicity, um, certain wow. certain problems. Cadmium was a discussion for a while where if you were to have um, wheat production on land that had maybe been perhaps used for industrial uses prior, um, you would see some of that spillover. Um, you know, we obviously know that there's a pollution issue uh, there. So we saw that USDA number increase, you know, relatively substantially overall, um, and only to see the export, the import number um, come in um, 
you know, just slightly lower, a half a million metric tons, so about 18 million bushels. So um, it is still something that's taking place. What do you place. do with wheat that's not edible? <laughs> you try to feed it to animals um, or... Those poor uh, guys. Yeah, yeah, or you just pretend it's there and it matters when we all know it really doesn't. So, and you know, and, and that's the one thing that's why it's so important is if you look at the overall global supply, you're looking at 266.71 million metric ton, but if you remove China um, from those those numbers, you're down to 123 million. So China right now is is accounting for you know a, a pretty substantial amount in the global supply and demand setup. So in theory, it's skewing the numbers. They're responsible for 54% of the world's wow. holdings of wheat, and so at face value, you think to yourself, well, we're, we're awash in wheat still, right? We still have plentiful wheat supplies. We don't know why anyone would be concerned about what's taking place in Russia, you know, the, the Kazakhstan, Ukraine, you know, your your former Soviet Union areas that have really yeah, stepped that, up. That was a breadbasket. What, and what yeah. is going on there? You know, uh, we're currency seeing... people. So. Yeah, <laughs> you're seeing them uh, return to the marketplace, uh, you know, pretty substantially. We actually have seen Russia become the world's uh, largest uh, exporter of wheat. Uh, if you look at uh, the expectation, wow. Russia is, is going to have 35 million metric ton of exports uh, versus the U.S. at just under 28 million. Um, you know, so there's a, a huge change there, and, and that's very important. Now, it's it's interesting to note uh, that the Russian government has kind of come out and said that their wheat exports may be a bit lower than the USDA's estimates. Um, you know, there's been conversation there that, that uh, Russian es exports should be about 3 million metric ton lower um, than currently estimated by the USDA here. But that, you know, obviously with China kind of stepping up what they're holding on to and, and other folks out there having um, supply, um, it's, it'll be important to kind of pay attention to. But the wheat story is really one that's kind of just um, now developing, you could say. A lot of the wheat that went in this um, fall uh, went into less than stellar conditions, at least in my neck of the woods, Michigan and Ontario. Uh, we plant winter wheat in the fall. So you tend to plant winter wheat September, last half September into October. Um, most guys like to have their wheat in the ground by the by Halloween in order to get a solid stand before it basically goes to sleep uh, for the winter months. So we did right. see um, the anticipation was we were going to see a huge increase in, in wheat acres because of the price being five fifty to six dollars on the July 19 board at one point in time. Um, but now we have seen, you know, Mother Nature kind of said, hey, hold up on that idea because of you know, condition issues, things like that in the Southern Plains. So if we see continued dryness as we're seeing right now um, in the former Soviet Union, specifically in some of those areas in Russia, the Ukraine, um, they've been a little dry this fall. Uh, there's been some issues in Argentina and Brazil. The idea is Brazil could actually increase their needed imports of wheat because of the, the trade issue. And their subsequent increase in uh, soybean um, exports and, and value of their soybean exports there for farmers. You know, so there's a lot of, of interesting things. Australia's production was dropped this last month. Uh, the USDA is actually still a million uh, to two million metric ton above where the Australian government is. Um, so that was what was really interesting with the USDA taking China's numbers at face value, basically, is they don't tend to do that with anyone else. Um, was it, uh, you know, a, a peace offering of some sort or something of that nature, you know, perhaps, but um, it was interesting to see overall. So yes, they are still stockpiling wheat, um, but you could take a look at the corn numbers and say they're actually stockpiling those corn, that, that corn supply um, even more than they are on the, the wheat side of things. Interesting, Angie. So uh, after the tariffs went into effect, uh, what group of in the agricultural uh, sector faced the most damage and challenge? Uh, was it the soybean farmers mm -hmm. uh, that China went elsewhere to South America instead of uh, you uh, buying from us after we developed that market for so many years? Yeah, I mean, that was a, a major issue. So let's pull up, um, you know, the world supply and use estimates. And and I like to just take a look at what the USDA puts out because it gives us a, an accurate, you know, non, 
you yeah. could say non-biased opinion, depending on on your opinion on on the overall situation. But um, you can definitely see uh, the issues or the 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 problems that we're seeing when it comes to the the trade um, spat, trade war, if you want to call it that, and and a lack of resolution as we've worked our way into the new crop year now. Uh, China being prevalent in the market structure and value when it comes to soybeans. When I started in this business uh, 13, 14 years ago, you know, a, a bushel of soybeans tend what used to go for about five uh, to six dollars. Um, right. Through 2012 into 2013, you know, we saw them go up to about 17 and a half because of the increase in Chinese demand. That explosion, um, obviously, the reduction in production that took place in 2012 because of the drought. You know, things of that nature. So we've seen this really interesting um, supply side setup take place, you know, prim primarily because of that increase in Chinese demand and overall demand as a whole. We've seen crush demand increase um, substantially on the domestic side of the market as well. Um, you know, just all kinds of, of uh, interesting all kinds of uh, sets up. People, people enjoying tofu. Yeah, like, tofu. Right. Um, Soybean oil, uh, biodiesel obviously has, has yeah. stepped up. There's a need for some soy oil. We've seen some world production issues when it comes to palm oil. Um, and so obviously uh, soybean oil can step in as a, a relatively decent replacement on that side. But uh, reality is um, looking at where we had started when it comes to May um, export estimates. So if you look back at the USDA's initial export estimates for soybeans um, versus May, when we weren't really in um, a heated uh, trade war, you could say, or we hadn't necessarily seen China really move away from from our uh, supplies to now, um, you know, we've lost uh, 400 million bushel or so of demand. Um, obviously, China has also lowered how much they're looking at from an import standpoint. Uh, we saw in this last go around here, the USDA lowered their import uh, estimates uh, from 90 million or 94 million metric ton, excuse me, to 90 million. Um, prior to um, this year or at the start of this year, there was conversation that that would be 100 million. You know, so like I said, you're looking at uh, 36, 37 million, uh, 37 bushels and a metric ton. So you're talking that 370 million bushel uh, reduction, which is led over into, you know, just this phenomenally huge um, carry out estimate uh, for soybeans at this point in time when it comes to what the U.S. is going to do. Now, we have seen record production. Our, our production numbers are up uh, substantially. If you look at uh, U.S. production in, in 2016-17 there versus now, it's an 11 million metric ton difference or, you know, 400 million bushels. So that price, that demand, all of that has encouraged that increase in acres. And suddenly we ran into a big brick wall when it comes to that demand growth. And and here we sit. So, you know, um, if I was a soybean farmer and, 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 you know, farmers have so many challenges. I really mm -hmm. am in awe of, you know, what they have to go through just to bring in a crop. Uh, what they need to hope for and weather, et cetera. Uh, and then the government coming in and uh, kind of taking a market away from them. I I'd be a little discouraged about replanting. Is any of that going on? Yeah, that is a conversation that we're seeing take place right now, you know, across the countryside. The USDA released their baseline numbers so that every November they'll come out with, you know, basically kind of the the bone structure that they're going to use to build their supply and demand estimate for the following year um, in November. So it gives us something to look at um, and kind of talk about as we move ahead. And we did see the USDA anticipate a 6 million acre decrease in uh, planting this following spring due to the drop in prices, due to the issues that we're having, uh, the plentiful supply across uh, much of the countryside, specifically in the, the Western Corn Belt. We continue to hear about what's taking place with North Dakota. You know, because of that Chinese market drying up, their uh, train rail demand, they used to be able to rail it into the, the Pacific Northwest and, and ship it out that way we saw that you know market virtually become non-existent this past harvest so um 
you're seeing a lot of those pictures of, of plentiful soybean supplies, soybean mountains, if you will. You know, and the market structure is one that if you take a look at uh, the difference in November beans, which are getting ready to expire, they'll be done today at uh, uh, noon, one o'clock uh, Eastern. But you take a look at the difference between um, July and uh, November, and I mean, you're looking at uh, a 50 cent um, carry situation. So, um, yeah. in in this side, we we call it carry, though I think contango is is much more fun of a, a way a word, much more fun word to say. But um, so the market structure itself is telling you you need to hold beans, put them in your garage if you need to, whatever. But you look at right. next year though, and and that is one thing that has kind of come up. You look at uh, November 19, um, and you're seeing them stay relatively solid at that, that 9.35 price. Um, versus these corn right now is trading about four bucks. Um, so there are some farmers out there that are actually not in a big hurry to transition away from soybeans simply because 935, 875 cash or so, um, or if they they see that continuation of solid carry in the market structure, um, you know, there's 11 cents between the uh, note 19 and, and January and, and a continued carry structure as well. So. You know, you're looking at uh, some opportunities. So some farmers are in a hurry to, I say chicken in the yard it, that's what I call it. If you've ever been around a flock of chickens, you know if you throw corn in one sector of the yard, then they all run there. And if you throw corn in, the, in another direction, they all run there. Um, some farmers are really good at that when it comes to market prices. Oh, I'm going to where the, the pile of corn is now. Others right. have uh, rotational constraints, uh, disease issues, things like that. So you have to make sure that you you know, maybe if you planted corn this year in one field, it's soybeans next year, um, something like that. Uh, bankers are also stepping in and saying that soybeans are cheaper to produce and a more uh, steady crop. So soybeans tend to yield, if, if you're producing a, a 45, 50 bushel to the acre soybean crop this year, next year, you're probably going to also be 45 to 50 bushel to the acre. So you can kind of count on uh, revenue being a bit more steady and the cost of um, planting soybeans is much cheaper, especially with the recent run-up that we've seen in chemical and fertilizer costs when it comes to, to putting corn in the ground. So there's yeah, a lot of variables still at play. Yeah, how about lower energy prices? Does that have been beneficial to the uh, not, sector? Yeah, not so far um, that we've seen. There are some issues that we've seen. Uh, chemical production, a lot of our chemical imports, um, when I say chemicals, I'm talking herbicides, um, insecticides, were coming, they were imported from China. Uh, so it's been interesting okay. to see. It's been kind of a two-part issue on that side. Uh, one part being that the Chinese government obviously cracking down on pollution and things of that nature has um, limited uh, some of these uh, production facilities that were in the, the market structure prior. And then obviously mm -hmm. they're not in a hurry to ship us um, product to, to produce. If they are going to, it's going to be more expensive. So we've seen that uh, take place. We've also seen some consolidation in the fertilizer end of things. So we have about two main suppliers. Um, and obviously, you know, a limited supply pool uh, tends to lead to an increase in um, the cost of that product okay. as they control um, that production. So we've seen, like right now for us, 28% uh, and 32%, that's a, a nitrogen. Um, uh, production of corn hinges upon nitrogen availability at a reasonably cheap level. Nitrogen can uh, reflect the energy market structure as well. Um, so a lot of times if, if the price of fertilizer goes up, uh, suppliers may point to an increase in energy costs as a reason behind it. Uh, it does okay. tend to lag a month or two, so it'll be interesting to see if next month this changes. But at this point in time, we are a, a retail supplier of nitrogen and, and fertilizer products, and we cannot even get our hands on to own 28 or 32 percent uh, fertilizer for next spring. So that could also have some pretty large implications on uh, what is going to take place when it comes okay. to planting corn as well. Uh Speaking about implications, uh, I haven't looked at a price chart in the grains for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, were they, uh, has the strong dollar impacted the grain charts as much as it has, say, uh, other commodity markets that have been under severe pressure, uh, crude being a great example, but metals not doing well either. Uh, I'm wondering if the, the dollar has had impact on grain prices. 
you could say um, it does from a day to day sort of standpoint. I'm just pulling up my easy okay. go to chart, um, not okay. uh, um, endorsing anything by any means. But um, yeah, I hear you. for me, just looking I, I at uh, like see it. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, looking at like uh, these 18 weeks. So this, this is the six month view. Let's go out to a year. Um, you know, we did have some some significant upside that took place the first part of, of August um, right. here that, that we saw. Now, that was on the idea that, that weather. Uh, weather, Russia, there was conversation that Russia was going to limit their exports, that their crop was much smaller than anticipated. Uh, what a turnaround world. You know, when I, first, when I first broke into the business, the big deals were us selling wheat to Russia. Now yes, it's the other yeah. way around. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, it, the great grain it, robbery uh, and all that fun yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, I remember people who made millions at the CBOT on that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, that's a feat in itself with my age remembering that. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, they but look they really, like uh, we looked like it's at a pretty good support level down here. Mm -hmm, so, yeah. uh, does the corn and the beans look similar? Similar kind of. Yeah. Uh, Peaking yep, in the is. summer and pulling back into the fall and winter. Which tends to be very seasonal um, in the, the grain structure itself. But yeah, they do look very, very similar. So if you go and look at a full chart on the, the Dees corn, um, pull that up and look at a, a year time frame as well. And you okay. will see that the, the high of the market structure uh, took place actually this year very early. Typically, uh -huh. you would see this. Yeah. This higher level take place about a month uh, or two later, but we had a very good June um, when it came to production. Once we were able to get the crop planted, uh, we got plentiful rainfall throughout the month of June, and then obviously the the trade war fears began to to really ramp up. Um, so you did see that uh, price, you know, basically deconstruction take place as we worked our way into to lows. Actually, you know, very very surprisingly. Um, you know, we, we almost thought we were going to maintain a contract low that was set in July. Typically, the 4th of right. July is when you would say the high of the market structure is supposed to come into play, not the, the low end. Inverted, so, cycles inverted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're actually seeing a backward type cycle here. Uh, we did see a new low put in place there after the September report. When the There's US one more came coming. Out. There's one yeah. more coming. I, I see a three drive formation. We have two. It looks incomplete. But uh, how yeah. about a quick look at uh, the beans? Quick look at the soybean yeah. chart will show you a very, very similar um, uh, phase on that side. You're looking at the January board now. Obviously, okay. the like I said, the November is coming off. Um, right. So Jan's going to become the lead month, and and I imagine we'll fall into line with where the November board is is going off at this point. So to click okay. on that full chart, looking at a one-year full chart, um, yeah, the, the soybean market shows a much more dramatic fall off. It, it, the high of yeah. the market was put into play, yeah. obviously, Terrible. around that same day, uh, 529. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, we did have a, a great June. Um, so that led to this. But now we're basically sitting in this new type of, of channel. You know. Yeah, one more yep. low. Uh, it looks like uh, our uh, new range at this point, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. 906. Yeah. Okay, so uh, which of the three that we just looked at charts at um, has the most compelling fundamentals? Because you are, you know, elite in your fundamental analysis. Uh, which one has the biggest bull case going forward over the next year or so? And I know it's not wheat a recommendation to, me, is... to buy. Wheat still. No. Okay. Yeah, no. But wheat is, yeah, wheat is the, the main story, the main driver, I think, at this point. I think corn as a whole, we, we have a, a knowledge of that, of, you know, what's taking place. Unless we were to see the administration do something that would be beneficial um, as a whole to the ethanol industry, we did see them say that uh, we would introduce E15, but we're really fighting the, the API in that, the American Petroleum Institute. Uh, they want to uh, sue <laughs> for that. They're not uh, uh, not sue. happy to, yeah, not Kill happy. Kill all the lawyers. Outside. Kill yeah, all the lawyers. Uh, get rid of them because they do not want to <laughs> give up that uh, that five percent increase. You know that five percent of demand. They definitely do not want to give up. So we've seen the administration yeah. kind of gut the renewable uh, fuels market to a certain extent. So corn had a, a very compelling story. It still could have a very compelling yeah. story. Uh, the major changes in China last week uh, kind of put that fire out, at least in my belly, for a minute. Now, everyone will say that China doesn't matter, but, um, you know, if China was, was a lot closer to running out of supplies, you know, like they were, 
you know, before the the change in numbers here a week ago, I would have, I did say, um, and I'll be published as saying that, you know, I thought a trade war resolution would be more beneficial to corn and ethanol um, with China wanting to increase their ethanol blends and things of that nature. Now the, the jury's out on that a little bit for me, at least at this point in time, but wheat overall, you know, like I said, you, you remove China and, and you're down to a, a relatively tight uh, stocks to use ratio as a whole we run into any further production issues, which right now we have an El Nino weather pattern that's starting to develop, um, yeah. <laughs> which can cause some issues um, for production here in the U.S. and in South America as well. And we want you to- You know what else makes it strong, Angie? It was yeah. a strong story when we last talked. Yeah. And that was that was six months ago or so, I'm not exactly sure. And we've yeah. gone through all, we've gone through, uh, you know, tariff spats, tariffs uh, being enacted, and it's still the best story. And it has yeah, the best yeah. looking chart of the three. So mm -hmm. great interview. Great interview, yeah. Angie. Well, thank you, you for want, having you me. Want to show your web, you want to show your website and how people could follow your work? Because yeah, I uh, do believe, I do believe once we get a dollar high in here, that all mm -hmm. commodities will, uh, the pressure will be taken off. and just on a nominal basis and yeah, uh, uh you, yeah you know what i mean yeah oh and i agree I, I you know when commodities tend to benefit from inflation especially on the grain side and so if we were to see some inflationary pressures start to develop which has been the conversation obviously you know in 2010 we really didn't have a fundamental story but if you look back at the charts you'll see that it became a good buy out of the idea that we were going to see inflationary pressure after that you know, significant increase in investments in our economy. But uh, our website, citizenselevator.com, you know, if you're not in the, the, the ag market sector, it might not be that uh, interesting to you, but we do have some market commentary that goes over. Um, and then if you pull up here, you can see, uh, I put a weekly summary together every week. So you can go back through and, and take a look at uh, what I'm talking about each week. I also post it on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me there at Goddess of Grain um, if you're interested. You know, I, I, what I really love about grains, Andy, is uh, the Fed can tighten all they want. It's mm -hmm. not going to increase uh, the grain supply. Yeah. Okay. It's definitely and, not and something they we, also, can, we, we yeah. can't shut a pipeline. You can't, you know, you can't, uh, you can't yeah. decide on a Monday you're going to shut off uh, production or, or hide it. I mean, it's been something farmers have talked about for years. and and uh, controlling supply but uh, you know the the more you produce as a farmer the more revenue you have and and that's the driving factor as a whole yeah and even qe if there's a shortage of grains mm -hmm. uh the fed can't print wheat corn or beans nope nope well, so, so it's... you know that's why i bring in i i love the sector i think they're very pure great trading technical markets and you need to have a good fundamental background so you're my go-to person my go-to lady, <laughs> woman. I appreciate in, that, yeah. In, in grains, and uh, thank you so much for taking the time out to be with me and our community, Angie. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, I always enjoy it. Yeah, it was great. So uh, I wish you and your family happy holidays and uh, you know that you have a bumper crop uh, for the rest of the year in your life and all, you, and all the people you love. Well, thank you, you too. Thank you, Angie. All right, everyone, that's Angie Setzer. That's a wrap for us today. And have a great day. See you in the members' chat. And remember, don't just count your pips. Count your blessings. I have David Brady with us tomorrow. You guys love him. So uh, good hunting the rest of the day. Adios. Thank you, Angie.